good to be back for a second season of Retroactivate, the podcast where we discuss classic LPs that merit another listen. As always, I'm your kindly old Uncle G, connoisseur, provocateur, and tour guide. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything this year. Robert Christgau takes Iggy Pop's 1982 recording Zombie Birdhouse to task for its slogans, social theory, in-jokes, and bad poetry. For me, all of this kind of works, particularly the bad poetry. Iggy has always had a way of distilling an outsider's internal howl down to a haiku-like urban outburst. Consider the jagged elegance of No Fun by Babies No Fun or I Won't Grow Anymore. The guy could be the Mashu Bishu of counterculture bumper stickers and lapel pins. I'm convinced as well that bad poetry can sound pretty cool set to loud guitars. This flawed masterpiece opens with Run Like a Villain, an invitation to join Mr. Osterberg for a moment of pleasantry in his zombie birdhouse, a place where absurdity takes the edge off any real villainy going down. In this song, we meet Big Dick, a thumbs-up guy who shot a missile in the sky, a guy who buys into the missile's ad campaign until he sees the fire it causes. We meet Tracy as well, a mindless Reagan-era consumer who has found herself slash lost herself in her pedigreed Afghan designer jeans and Sony Walkman. The song chugs along effectively to its dreadful drum program with Iggy breaking the social critique with this bit of gothic loveliness. The shining moon, the dead oak tree, nights like this appeal to me. I can't help it. Non sequiturs like these appeal to me. It might be bad poetry, but it beats the hell out of Ride the Snake to the Lake. And though I rather like Jim Morrison as one-fourth of the doors, his particular brand of bad poetry is too strong an influence on, as Zombie Birdhouse continues. Ordinary Bummer is too much an homage to the end. And though I like that it's a love song to a gal who swears like a sailor, the Raga Rock intro should have been reconsidered and was played down when album producer Chris Stein covered the track with Blondie. Here we have a unique track that Iggy could have pulled off had someone clamped down on the arrangement and talked him out of the recitation at the end about good people and bad people doing good and bad things. This final bit isn't even committed enough to qualify as bad poetry. The record gets points for trying, and it almost clicks as an homage to classic horror movies, Bella Lugosi stuff. We're never too far from Thumbs Up Dick as Missile and its nuclear fire. We've clearly become the zombie consumers, the dum-dum boys and girls, and we've probably become the vengeful torchbearers that Iggy sings about in The Villagers as well. Sneaking peeping toms and revolt against each other. The confusion arises when Mr. P breaks the spell to lecture us on these evils. Someone here should have encouraged Iggy to keep throwing tonally complex verbal spitballs and forego the moral of the story. Any number of wankers would mislead us into thinking that the singular joy Iggy Pop brings to the table has something to do with peanut butter and broken glass. The real gift Iggy consistently brings is his ability to identify, celebrate, and condemn the finest points of human absurdity in a single stroke. Is he joking about the lotion and where we obtained it? Is he pulling our leg when he's wondering who let Murph the Surf hang out on his ceiling? Yep. Is he sincere about all of that as well? He is. That flippant moon cast a serious moonlight. Get out your Ouija boards and ask Bowie if you need confirmation. 
It's good to see Ypsilanti's Forgotten Boy trying new material out, but neither producer Chris Stein nor Rob Dupree, Iggy's songwriting collaborator, seem to see the center that this recording constantly needs to be pulled back to. There's a cowboy sub-theme established in The Ballad of Cookie McBride, Life of Work and Horse. There's the groovy rock haiku bulldozer that would have better fit Pop's Soldier LP. The lyrics often feel improvised and experimental, but improvisation and experiment are neutral modes of expression, even important modes of expression when joined by consistency. The real shortcomings here have to do with the music being phoned in and unfinished. Eat or Be Eaten, for example, kicks in with a great guitar lick that fails to repeat and become a memorable riff. Interesting, ungrounded playing comes and goes without ever achieving ambience or contributing to a modal structure that seems to want to break free here. Iggy's post Stooges work is plagued by the whole fan as producer concept. Going back over 70s and 80s rock criticism, one finds the whole game of whose turn is it to save Iggy voiced explicitly. I can't help but wonder what this album could have been had it been produced by Brian Eno, or even a radio-friendly taskmaster like Roy Thomas Baker, some shepherd of record albums rather than a wrangler of Iggy Pop, someone, anyone, with enough song sense to assure the artist that his understanding of Mo Howard is more profound than Jim Morrison's tentative grasp of William Blake. Osterberg's poetry emerges on Zombie Birdhouse even without such a producer. Perhaps not as consistently as we would have it, but against all odds. As always, it's been swell that the swelling's gone down. I'll be back next month with more on the music that built and then threatened to destroy and then had a tickle fight with everything hipsters like us hold dear. Be sure to subscribe. I wouldn't be a party without you. This has been your kindly old Uncle G for the Retroactivate Podcast. Stay strange, and I'll see you soon.